I'm Debbie Walsh, and I'm the director of the Center for American Women and Politics at the Eagleton Institute of Politics, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you this evening. We're delighted that so many of you are joining us for this program, perhaps because you heard from one of the many co-sponsors of this event who've been very helpful in getting the word out. And you can find their names listed in your program. And I'd like to thank the representatives of those organizations that are here tonight for all of their help. Now, as many of you know, tonight's program was made possible by the generous support of the New Jersey State Legislature for the Senator Winona Lippman Chair in Women's Political Leadership. A distinguished advisory committee aids us in implementing the Lippman Chair, and I would like to thank two of the members of that committee who are here tonight. First, Kathy Crotty, the former executive director of the New Jersey Senate Democrats and a longtime colleague of Senator Lippman. as well as Alma Saravia, who worked with uh, Senator Lippman for many years as the executive director of the Commission on Sex Discrimination in the Statutes. Alma, thank you. I'm going to be saying a little more about Senator Winona Lippman in a moment, but I want you to know first that COP is fortunate to be able to apply funds provided by the legislature, where she serves so effectively, to honor her in three important ways. First, inspiring New Jerseyans with distinguished speakers whose work reflects her interests, as we are doing here tonight. Second, grooming potential office holders by providing Senator Winona Lippman scholarships for Essex County residents to attend Ready to Run, COP's bipartisan campaign training program for New Jersey women to encourage more women to literally follow in Senator Lippman's footsteps. And finally, Lippman share funds are also being used for preparing women to take on public leadership and political leadership by offering Senator Winona Lippman scholarships to women from community colleges who want to attend New Leadership New Jersey, COP's model initiative to educate and empower the next generation of our state's women leaders. Community colleges were very important to Senator Lippman, who taught at Essex County College for many years and understood that these institutions are the entry point to higher education for many women, particularly those from challenging circumstances. As we gather tonight, COP is gearing up for an exciting new initiative, one that I believe Senator Winona Lippman would have appreciated. Indeed, I would imagine that all of the women who have held the Lippman chair over the years would endorse this project, since the long-term goal of Teach a Girl to Lead is to make our image of public leadership more inclusive, recognizing that women and girls can and should lead. In 2011, President Barack Obama challenged the nations of the world to take action to empower women and girls. In response, the United States and a dozen nations have joined the Global Equal Futures Partnership. In developing Teach a Girl to Lead, COP is collaborating with the White House and the U.S. Department of Education to align our new initiative with the administration's broader civic engagement efforts. The, new, the unique website that we're creating will connect educators, leaders of youth organizations, parents, authors, librarians, women leaders, and students. It will offer one-stop shopping for anyone interested in expanding civic engagement and public leadership opportunities for girls and young women. We'll be providing resources to help educate both boys and girls about the importance of civic participation and the significant roles that women have played and continue to play in our democracy. When we seek to teach young people about women leading, Senator Winona Lippman is certainly a superb example. She was the first African-American woman in the state Senate representing Essex County for 27 years in the New Jersey legislature. Over those years, she became the strongest and most consistent voice in the legislature for women and minorities. You'll find a brief bio of Senator Lippman in the program, and you can learn more about this extraordinary woman in an expanded bio that's on our website. But for now, it's important to recall that Senator Lippman was the legislature's leading advocate 
on behalf of children, families, low-income people, small businesses, and people with AIDS. She tackled issues including employment discrimination, marriage law, child support, the rights of children, sexual assault, and domestic violence. For many of her years in the Senate, she was the only woman there. It's rather shocking to think about. And she was always speaking up for those with the least access to the political process and always, always alert to the political implications of race and gender. So when we were looking for a speaker whose work would be consistent with Senator Lippmann's legacy, a leader in formulating domestic policy seemed like an ideal choice. And we were delighted that Melody Barnes accepted our invitation. Melody Barnes was assistant to President Obama and director of the White House Domestic Policy Council from January 2009 to January 2012. She provided strategic advice to the president and worked closely with members of the cabinet, coordinating the domestic policy agenda across the administration. Under her leadership, innovative new policies, practices, and partnerships were initiated to, ad uh, to address significant national challenges, including education, health care, and the federal government's relationship with local governments and communities. She is now CEO of Melody Barnes Solutions, a domestic strategy firm and vice provost for global student leadership initiatives and a senior fellow at the Robert F. Wagner School of Public Service at New York University. Melody also serves as a senior director at the Albright Stonebridge Group, a global strategy firm. She's chair of the Aspen Institute Forum for Community Solutions and on the board of directors of the Marguerite Casey Foundation. Until July of 2008, she was the Executive Vice President for Policy at the Center for American Progress, a progressive research institute and think tank. Earlier, she worked for Senator Edward M. Kennedy on the Senate Judiciary Committee, serving as his chief counsel for five years. Her experience also includes an appointment as Director of Legislative Affairs for the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. She received her law degree from the University of Michigan and her bachelor's from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her media appearances, I'm sure you have all watched them, I see her all the time, I love it, include This Week with George Stephanopoulos, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, Charlie Rose, Morning Joe, News Hour with Jim Lear. Policies that empower is a term that Senator Lippmann would no doubt have appreciated, and we're delighted that our speaker has chosen that as her topic. It is my great honor and pleasure to present Melody Barnes. Well, Debbie, thank you so, so much for that wonderful introduction. And it is such a pleasure to be here with all of you all this evening in this really, really beautiful, beautiful chapel. Thank you for having me. I also want to say that I deeply appreciate the presence of Senator Lippmann's former colleagues and friends, those who worked with her and who knew her and who love her and respect her. It is such an honor to have you all here this evening as well. And I also, like Debbie, want to acknowledge the support of the New Jersey legislature in supporting this chair and acknowledging the many contributions that Senator Lippmann made. I also want to take a moment of personal preference and to thank my uncle, Lawrence Barnes, for being here, who is a resident of New Jersey, lives in Montclair, and I can tell you as an only child, as a, a, the only niece, as the only grandchild on one side of the family, that the Barnes family, though it is small, turns out for significant occasions. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> And this, of course, is a significant occasion. I accepted this invitation rapidly and, and heartily um, because it is such an honor to be here. I know that I stand on the shoulders not only of Senator Lippmann, but of the women who have stood here before you in the years before, many of them friends and, and former colleagues like Valerie Jarrett, who was here most recently with you, and Michelle Norris, and going back to the giant that um, was Shirley Chisholm. So thank you so much for adding me to that list. I would also say that it's a pleasure to be here with the students and young men and young women who are here. 
Um, one of the things that I decided to do when I left the White House was to spend time in an academic environment, to spend time at a university. And most recently, my husband and I were in Abu Dhabi at NYU's portal campus there. And one night we were out and we were watching students literally from a hundred different countries um, spend time with each other, just engage in talking. And we were watching students who had never met before, a few days before, who culturally were very different from one another. And my husband looked at me and he said, we're going to be all right. And he's right. And that's exactly the way I feel. You all are leaders. You all have taught us and are teaching us so much. So it is wonderful to be here with you. And hopefully there are a few things that I can share tonight that I hope will be meaningful to you as well. So the New Jersey State Legislature, I think, had an, any number of reasons why they could have created and supported the Lippman Chair. When Evelyn Winona Lippman was born in 1923 in LaGrange, Georgia, and I'm from the South, so I understand what life is like in the South. Most of the people in her community were involved in tenancy and sharecropping. So if you are from the Deep South and you understand what a summertime is like sharecropping or spending it outside, you know what kind of hard work that is. And yet, in spite of the vast community of those who were working and laboring in the fields, her family really put a premium on education. And as a result, in 1940, at a time when fewer than 2,000 African Americans in her community, actually in the state of Georgia, had received a high school diploma, Senator Lippman went on to graduate from high school at 16, and like all of her brothers and sisters, she went on to receive a post-secondary degree, and then she went on to study French at Atlanta University. She also received a Rockefeller grant. She later, later received a Fulbright scholarship. She went on to study at the Sorbonne in Paris, which I can tell you because right now I'm taking French lessons. That's really hard. <laughs> um, you learn it while you're young. Um, and she went on and studied there and met her future husband there. Eventually, as you all know, she settled in Montclair, New Jersey, and she became very active in her community, very active in local politics, and started out, you know, this link, uh, this, this uh, human link of mothers in protest for something that they were trying to accomplish for their children. She understood that grassroots politics, that working for your community was critical and important. And once she got her start there, she didn't look back. She went on to become a Democratic chairperson, the town chairman, the Essex County Freeholder, then to go on to be director of the Essex County Freeholder Board. And in each position, her voice became stronger and stronger. She was unafraid. She was tenacious. She was unstoppable. She understood, as I said, what it meant to work for your community. And using the phrase of the day, Winona Littman knew what it meant to lean in. Now, of course, when women lean in, often people think they need to be pushed out. And as a result, you can almost see the meeting or hear the meeting when people thought, you know, maybe what we need to do with this feisty, tenacious, determined, smart, savvy woman is we're going to kick her upstairs. We're going to send her to the Senate, and maybe she'll cause a little bit less trouble there. That's what we'll do. <laughs> well, that was bright for those who were trying to keep her down because that was only the beginning. That's when Winona Lippman got escape velocity. And she went on to take the position in 1971 at age 49 in a very narrow victory to become New Jersey's first African-American woman state senator. And there she spent years with a career and creating a legacy that included 145 bills championing the issues of those who were the most vulnerable women and children, those who were living in cities that were struggling, those who were struggling with AIDS and other health care issues, small business owners, that's where she chose to plant her flag. And what an amazing job she did. But what really grabbed me when I went on to do my research on Senator Littman was that this woman, this African American, this Southerner, this personal and professional trailblazer, community activist, a wife, a mother, this legislator, 
She understood power and she understood the inextricable relationship between power and creating smart public policy. What she did and the way she did it means that tonight we shouldn't just pay tribute to Senator Littman. We should use her life as a teachable moment. As I said, Senator Littman understood power, and she did not give her power away. Instead, she became an indomitable force for change, for change that was so desperately needed across the state of New Jersey, indeed across our entire country. And this phrase is what caught my eye, and this is what really was the seed for what I want to talk to you about tonight. Because Earlier on, I mentioned this period of grassroots leadership and being involved in her community. She was one of the first African-American PTA presidents in Montclair. And she was pushing the town leadership for something. And they said to her, you know what? You need to get to know someone who's important. And Winona Littman thought about it. And she thought, no, what I need to do is to become someone important. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about her work through that lens. As I said, she dedicated her career to crafting policy, crafting legislation, and implementing it. Too often people think the work stops after the crafting. It's the implementation that's so critical. And to improving the lives of women and children and those who are living in poverty and rebuilding cities in New Jersey, particularly her beloved and adopted city of Newark. And in the early 1970s, when she was first elected, the challenges were mammoth. And we have seen such important change over the last 40 plus years. And yet those challenges still remain with us. And I just wanna give you a snapshot of that to talk about a couple of, a couple of things. So think about the, the, the change that's taken place for women. And think about where we were in the early 1970s. So in 1970, fewer than half of women received fewer, fewer than half of all undergraduate degrees. They received fewer than 40% of graduate degrees and fewer than 10% of professional and doctoral degrees. Fast forward to where we are today, and the numbers have changed substantially. About 60% of college associate's degrees, about 57% of bachelor's degrees, and just under half of all PhDs. And I mention that because, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, education is so important, and those post-secondary credentials are so critical to economic security and to the jobs of the future. And we know that the vast majority of jobs that are going to be coming online over the next five, six, seven years will require some kind of post-secondary degree. So those shifts, while critical, while important, while good, while necessary, not enough. And think about the poverty rate. And this is something that our country has struggled with for decades. You know, you think we're about to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the war on poverty in January. And yet our poverty rates have continued to climb. In 1970, the national poverty rate was about 13.7%. Here in New Jersey, it was about 8.1%. And a disproportionate number of those who were living in poverty were people of color. Now the poverty rate, 14.3%. We're talking about 42 million people. And I'm, I'm pausing for a reason, because too often we just let that wash over us. 42 million people are living below the poverty line. And the vast majority, or a disproportionate number of those, over a quarter, are children who are under 18 years old. In New Jersey, the poverty rate is about 9.4%. Again, we continue to see a disproportionate number of people who are living in poverty are people of color. Bring it home, let's talk about Newark, the city that she adopted and that she loved. In, since 1950, we have watched the city of Newark start to hemorrhage in terms of its population. 
It now has a population below 1910 levels. It declined from 438,000 people in 1950 to about 275,000 people in 1990, a decrease of 37 percent. Think about what that means for your schools, what that means for your tax base, what that means for business and inviting business in. In 1967, media coverage of the riots that took place in, in Newark led to this idea of the Newark mystique. The idea that this was a city that wasn't worthy, that couldn't be saved, a city that was dangerous. And as that started to perpetuate itself, it led to that decrease in population that I was just talking about. And a redevelopment program, and you think about this, a redevelopment program that was based in the idea of demolition. And today, we see a city where 31% of the residents have an income level that, again, is below the rate of poverty. So this isn't going to be a speech about all the bad things that have happened and all the challenges, how, how difficult the challenges are, though I want to talk about what we can do to reach escape velocity as we're facing these challenges. In fact, the point I want to make here is that with all of these communities that Senator Littman focused on, women, young people, people of color, those living in cities, the people that she saw needed the smart policies that she was trying to put in place. Today, those very same communities have become the key for our country. Isn't it ironic that people of color, immigrants, new immigrants, women and children are now critical to American competitiveness? Those that we're trying to make sure are getting those post-secondary degrees, those that we're trying to make, escape, make sure escape poverty, are the very people who are going to be critical to determine, determining whether or not our country grows, whether or not we are globally competitive, whether or not we continue to sit in a place of importance on the national and global stage. In fact, I would say that the civil rights agenda of the 20th century has now become the American competitiveness imperative of the 21st century. The demographic shifts that are taking place tell us that our economy will rely on the very people that Senator Littman was focusing on 40 years ago. Give you more color around that. So Im immigrants constituted more than 50% of the overall growth in our labor pool. Between 1994 and 2004, the native-born labor force grew about 7%. The immigrant labor force, and that includes those who are naturalized, those who are legal permanent residents, as well as a quarter of those who are undocumented, grew 66%. In the year 2015, 38% of our population will be people of color. By the year 2030, the majority of our labor force under the age of 25 will be people of color. By the year 2040, we will live in a 50-50 country, and by the year 2042, the majority of all our labor force will be comprised of people of color. We have to get the policy right. And at the same time, we think about the policy, and let's just sit that right here for a second. Let's talk about the shift in American politics as a result of these same demographic shifts. Latinos and African Americans and women, all and as well as urban dwellers, are a growing political force in our country. And I want to underscore these points, and this is, these aren't partisan statements. These are statements about data and fact, just looking at what happened in our last election. So Latino vote, voters overwhelmingly supported the winner of the last presidential election, President Obama. 71% of them voted for President Obama. And that 44% differential between the support for the president and the support for Governor Romney was the tipping point for the election. You look at New Jersey, a third of those who live in New Jersey are people of color, but as a result of their overwhelming support for the president, we saw that he was able to take carry the state of New Jersey. 
Women make up 53% of the electorate, and 62% of women voted for the president, which not only sent him back to the Oval Office, but also led to these historic shifts in the United States Congress. So now we have 20 female senators and 81 women in the House. Not just all women who voted for them, obviously, but you look at the growing force behind women and people of color in the American politic. With those facts in mind, we have to remember two things. One, as I said, we have got to get the policy right. Because as these demographic shifts take place in our country, we can't have a growing population that is also undereducated and economically insecure. And secondly, this progressive coalition that's being built that consists of people of all races and ethnicities, as well as women, and those from the LGBT community and the immigrant community, give us the power to put those policies in place. What should those policies look like? There are no single answers to the policy challenges that I was just talking about. We have complex, multifaceted challenges sitting in front of us, so there is no one single answer. But there are a couple of things that I want to mention, that I want to talk about tonight, that I think are key, that I think are critical. And the first being education, an issue that Senator Littman so deeply, deeply believed in. If we start focusing on this as a post-secondary degree issue only, we are too late. If we start focusing on this when folks are in 10th grade, we are far too late, or middle school, we have to start zero to three. We have to start at the beginning, and there is every piece of data out there that tells us that that is a smart investment to make. The Minnesota Federal Reserve says for every dollar that we put into early education, we get a 10 to $12 return on our investment. That is a smart investment. If I could get that out of my investment funds, I would be a happy, happy woman. Why aren't we making that investment as a country? We started that work when I was at the White House in a couple of different ways. One, enforcing and reinforcing our Head Start program. In the American Recovery Act, we made a $2.1 billion investment in Head Start to create additional slots for more children, and at the same time, completed work that was started during the Bush administration to ensure that Head, for, Head Start programs were smart programs, that they were quality programs, that small children, that poor children in these programs were getting the kind of education that they needed and deserved so that they would be able to go into kindergarten and not be behind. Right now, we see about a 70-point achievement gap between low-income children going into kindergarten and their peers. Can you imagine? You're five years old and you are 70 points behind. And we know that for children who haven't caught up by the time they're in third grade, who haven't achieved a third grade reading level, it's almost impossible for them to catch up with their peers. We also continued that work with a program called Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge. That was a $600 million investment to try and equalize and to raise the standards for all of our ed early education programs, whether that's Head Start or her early Head Start or pre-K. We have to make sure that we aren't talking about glorified babysitting services for, for small children, but indeed we're talking about education programs for small children. In addition to that, we then have to look at the continuum that gets us to K through 12. What the goal has to be, must be, is that when someone finishes high school, that they are ready for college or they are ready for a career. Right now, too many of our young people aren't ready for either. That is a national tragedy, and telling our young people that they are is a national lie. It's not a fib, it's not an oops, it's a lie. And we have to move beyond that. That meant that we started to work very closely with governors who were saying, we have got to raise our standards for our children. We have to make sure that our students 
have embraced the skills that they need, that employers are telling us that they need, to go into the workplace and to be prepared for college. It's not filling in a bubble. It's the analytic skills that they need. It's the communication skills that they need. It's the ability to work collaboratively with others and work their way towards a goal and through a problem set. Those are the kinds of skills that we need to make sure that students have. And those are the kind, that's the kind of work that I started when I was in the White House and that I believe we have to continue as a nation, whether it is this administration and states around the country. It also means that we have to tackle the problem of high school dropouts. 7,000 children dropping out of high school every single day. Every single day. If we lost 7,000 children, think about it, if you turned on CNN and you know there was Wolf Blitzer and he was saying 7,000 children went missing today, we'd bring out the FBI, the CIA, everybody to go looking for those kids. So why aren't we looking for those children who have disappeared from American classrooms? That means that the work that we're doing to turn around our public schools and to recapture those students, to bring them back into the classroom, to do it in interesting ways, to create pathways for them so that they can move from middle school and high school to a promising career and a post-secondary credential, those pathways are critical. It also means that we have to rethink what used to be known as our vocational education system. And that has all kinds of negative, negative connotations to it. It often meant tracking. It often meant the poor students and the minority students went one way, and all the students that were thought to be or perceived to be successful went another. Instead, we have to create a platform so that every student is getting an excellent education based on the kind of standards that I was talking about and at the same time, for those students who are interested in taking those skills and going into some kind of career and technical um, education program are able to do so. Because we also know that those kinds of programs, whether they are engineering programs or uh, mechanical programs, that those kinds of programs can lead to good, smart, middle-class jobs and that they also create a base for stacking credentials so that a student can go on and get a two-year degree at a community college, go on and get a four-year degree, or stack other kinds of credentials so they can continue to move through a, on a career ladder. Those are critical, critical elements of the K through 12 ed education program that we have to create for our country. At the same time, we have to take on this goal that I remember, you know, sitting in conference rooms and you know sitting in my car on a Sunday my husband's like beating on the window like are you coming into this brunch and I'm like no I'm trying to sit here and figure out with my colleagues what our education our higher education goal should be and what we came up with was the fact that we have to be by the year 2020 once again in the place that we can graduate the greatest proportion of college graduates in the world right now we are at best about ninth in the world that isn't going to cut it in the global, on the global stage. It's just not going to do it. But to get there, we have to bring every tool out of the toolbox. Debbie was talking about the community colleges that S Senator Littman loved. Critical element in getting this done. And that's why we made sure, when I was at the White House, to place an important investment in not only community colleges, but community college innovation to make sure that they were working with employers and others to understand not only what the curriculum should look like, but to make sure that students were prepared for jobs on the other side of, of that degree. It also means that we have to make sure that students who are prepared for college can actually go to college. And that means that we have to capture and get control of this issue of college costs. It is cutting off the ability for students and for families to pay for college. Right now, the cost of obtaining a university education has soared about 12-fold, more than 1,000% over the past 30 years. And it certainly hasn't kept up, or it has exceeded um, inflation. In fact, adjusted for inflation, the average aid per student has only increased about 3%. 3% increase in aid, 
a thousand percent increase in college costs, how does a family possibly keep up? One of the areas that we focused on was to put more resources into Pell Grants, to make them more robust for students. We also focused on making sure that students had an easier access to and greater um, ease in filling out those financial aid applications so that they could access the aid that was available to them. But we also have to focus on, and I've spent time since I've left the White House, working with those in the higher education community to think, of how can we be more innovative? How can we work with colleges and universities and community colleges to try and encourage a shift in the rising costs of college, which are going up higher than America's health care costs? That is a challenge that sits in front of us right now and requires every single one of us if we're going to tackle it. And while we're doing all of this, we can't turn our eyes away from those that we often call disconnected youth. I refer to them as opportunity youth. They are the 16 to 24 year olds, about 7 million of them, who are right now disconnected from education and from employment. They have dropped out of school. They have been failed as they have come out of the foster care system. They have in some way been connected to the juvenile justice system and are not getting an education and are coming out and don't have the skills that they need to go back into onto a path to education. Right now, that is a challenge that is costing our country about $93 billion every year. And for the lifetime, of one of those young people, it's costing us about $4.7 trillion. Not only their lost income, but increased social services, increased crime rates. It is a moral issue. It is an economic issue. It is one that we have to wrap our hands around. And we can do it. Those same pathways that I was talking about before, we know are proven pathways for those young people. National service is a proven pathway. I just spent last Friday with a young man who had dropped out of school. He had run away from home. He believed school wasn't for him. He fought with his parents. His family was fragmented. And it was through a Public Allies AmeriCorps program that he found his way back to education and to employment. And just three weeks ago, got married and is raising his family and working in a career that he loves. It doesn't just have to be Jamil. It can be those other seven million young people who are struggling as well. I also just want to mention immigration. We're watching every day the headlines in front of us. What is going to happen to this broken, fractured immigration system that we have? Again, there are important moral arguments for confronting this issue. We have to move 11 million people out of the shadows that are existing there. We have to reconnect young people to education, to post-secondary education who were brought here and didn't realize that they weren't American citizens. We also have to decrease the opportunities for people to be taken advantage of because they're vulnerable, because they are living in the shadows. But we also have to realize that there is an economic benefit to this country when more people, when more immigrants are given a pathway out of the shadows and into the American economy. We know that there's increased earning power of about $4.5 billion when that happens, if we pass a big comprehensive immigration bill. We know that our GDP will rise, and that's not progressive melody talking. They're conservative organizations that are giving us these same kinds of statistics. We can raise the pace of economic growth by almost a percentage point, which is, I can tell you from sitting in the White House and trying to figure that out, that is hard to do. We can reduce the cumulative federal deficit by about $2.5 billion if we get this right. Right now, we're sitting here and we know that there's been a plan that was released today by the Gang of Eight that's been working on this. The question is whether or not we're going to create enough political space, enough political momentum to get it done. I would argue, in the spirit, on the foundation of the kind of work that Senator Littman did, that it is critical that we do that for communities, for individuals, and for our country. And finally, I'll just mention health care. I can tell you after working on the Affordable Care Act for well over a year, and it was like an odyssey. I mean, who could believe all the different things that would happen on the road to passing that piece of legislation? 
that it is a critical bill for people who have been living in poverty, for women, and for people who are living with HIV AIDS. You know, you look at what's happened already in terms of the benefits for young people who are now able to access the insurance policies of their parents until they're 26 years old. We think about those children who have been living with pre-existing conditions who now can't be turned away. And I can tell you one day I was leaving, I'll be honest, I was leaving the hair salon. And <laughs> the woman, um, and I've been going to the same salon for a long time, and all of a sudden the receptionist jumped up and she followed me down the front steps. And uh, she grabbed me and she said, can I, can I talk to you for a second? I said, sure. And she said, is it true that a child that was born with a, with a problem now can get access to insurance? And I said, yeah. And she's like, and she grabbed my arm. She said, no. She's like, is that true? And I said, yes, that is true. And she said, that is the best thing that has ever happened to me. Because my little girl, who at that time was about three years old, was born with an illness, and I haven't been able to get health care insurance for her. It's real. It's not an ad. It's not a talking point. It's not a debating point. It's real, and it changes lives. We also know that The Medicare and preventative care coverage for seniors, about 34 million seniors who have been able to access preventative care since we passed the Affordable Care Act, that's real. And those kinds of benefits are going to become available for a broader pool of people for, for all Americans in the coming year. But part of what we have to do is to make sure and to educate people to, uh, so that they understand what those benefits are and the critical act of enrolling to access those benefits. Will this be perfect? No. Will there be hiccups? Will there be challenges and problems and things that have to be fixed? Yes. But have we come a long, 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 long way from the struggle that I saw my former boss, boss Senator Kennedy, fight with year after year, decade after decade, that we have been fighting to try and accomplish since the 50s and 60s? Absolutely. And by creating that health care exchange, by expanding Medicaid so that m more poor citizens have access to health care coverage, and those lifetime caps that used to prevent people with serious illnesses, illnesses like HIV, can now either access better health care or access health care at all, that they will receive better treatment? Absolutely. But again, it's not just that dry document that's going to do it. It's not just the creating and the passing of the law. It's also the implementing of the law as well. So those are just three policy areas that I think are critical and important to the communities that I know Senator Lippman cared so deeply about. But where, does, where do we go from here? And just a couple of words in conclusion. You know, I, as I was thinking about Senator Lippman, I was thinking about a woman that I've often read about and who has become a kind of hero for me. Her name is Nanny Helen Burroughs. And she was born at the turn of the last century. So in the early 1920s, she was about 20 years old, African American, living in Washington, D.C., and very active in her church. She was known at that time as a race woman, someone who was fighting for civil rights, who was fighting for women's rights in the early 1900s. And in spite of all the daunting challenges that were in front of her, she decided to open a school for women, something that I bet Senator Lippman would have loved. And her motto for the school was, we specialize in the holy impossible. You think about that, 1915, 1920, African-American woman, we specialize in the holy impossible. How audacious, how bold. I think that is a motto that Senator Lippman may have loved, certainly would have loved. And I think it is consistent with this bold, savvy, intelligent, tenacious woman 
who sat at some points alone in New Jersey State Senate doing the work that she did, looking out for the communities that she cared about. When she went about the business of becoming an important person, she wasn't focused on title or wealth. She, what she was focused on was using the mechanisms of the political system to accomplish substantive policy change. She was focused on doing her homework. She was focused on activating her network. She was focused on how can I move through this system so that I can get my agenda, an agenda for women and for children and for cities and for small business owners and for people who are sick and dying. How can I get that agenda front and center over the finish line and implement it? Because I read that Winona Lippman, after the bill was passed, she didn't go on her merry way. I see Kathy smiling and nodding. She followed up to make sure that it got implemented. In her words, she recognized the inextricable relationship between policy and politics and power. And that's why I will go back now to where I started. We have to build on her legacy. Working to collectively, we have to set those big goals. We have to measure and make sure that we are moving forward, not standing still or going backward. We have to communicate and work in coalition with one another. We have to build those big coalitions that can be powerful, that can move issues across the finish line. We have to bring together CEOs and students. We have to bring together philanthropists and grassroots advocates, nonprofit leaders and rabbis and imams and ministers and those who sit in congregations throughout the week. We have to bring together those who share a common purpose to get the job done. And when we do that, together we can shape policy, we can implement policies that help us accomplish nothing short of the holy impossible. And indeed, we can continue down a path and we can be those important people that Senator Lippman always knew we always were. Thank you so much. We're going to take about 20 minutes or so for some Q&A, and there are microphones of people with runners with microphones. Why don't you come out? And so if you have a question, just raise your hand, and Deanna and Sasha will get a microphone to you so we can all hear it. Ms. Barnes. My question to you is this. My question to you, you were talking about putting money into education, putting money uh, in education reformation, so that way young people such as myself who are disadvantaged, who are minorities, uh, could have a better future for themselves and their future families. How do you suggest that we reach out to those individuals who have been influenced by today's society in the way where they're having children at a very young age and they can't afford to help bring them up properly, how do you suggest that we help those people who, la who have no household discipline where they understand that society requires a certain amount of work ethic? Sure. I mean, th that's a great question and it raises so many complexities. I mean, I think one of the things that it's important to remember, and I've spent you know, the vast majority of my career working on the federal level, you know, the House, the Senate, the White House, um, and now some of the work that I'm doing, the work I'm doing at the Aspen Institute, has me engaged at the local level. But one of the things we have to remember is that there is no one sector that is going to solve the problem. Um, so that can't be just a federal government problem, or a local government problem, or an issue for the educational system. I mean, we have to think of this as holistically and recognizing the level of complexity that you just described. 
So, for example, uh, Jeff Canada, who runs the Harlem Children's Zone, and I've talked about this, we modeled some of the policy that uh, created promise neighborhoods at the White House off of the Harlem Children's Zone. And one of the things that Jeff talked about was when he first got started in Harlem, and he literally, it is a zone. He started with a one-mile zone. And one, he started with, we're just going to clean up this, this, this one-mile area. And he said, people were like, oh, you're crazy. You know, you clean it up, it'll be dirty. You fix the windows, they'll be broken. It's just, it'll, it'll be an endless, bottomless pit. He didn't care. So he started doing that work. And what he saw over time was as you started to clean it up, fix it up, it stayed put. People started to take pride in that. Then one of the things he wanted to focus on were young families, you know, young men, young women with children, or young families with children, and connecting them to the program, to the educational program that he was starting. And as Jeff would tell you, and many of you may have, have seen interviews with him, he's like, I was shameless. I would do anything to get them through the door, to connect. He was like, bribery, I don't care. Anything to bring them in the door and to connect them and to provide them with resources and information. So you start to bring people in. And then I, he said, I wanted the school to become a hub for the community and a place where people might play cards on Saturday night and kids would play basketball and students would also study as well as the place where children would start to go to school. So people would start to get comfortable in this place and with these programs and with these ideas and you could start sharing this information. Ultimately, the work, that kind of work, and as I said, we were trying to model that work with Promise Neighborhoods. One is holistic, it is wraparound with a whole range of different services coming from a lot of different sectors. Um, two, it isn't, it, 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 because it is multi-sector, it involves, it means there are churches and others in that community that, was, that were involved, are involved. It means the, um, the city was involved, the state. Ultimately, we became involved federally as we tried to replicate those programs. So in some ways, it, became, it was an issue of modeling. It was an issue of sharing information. It was an issue, in some cases, as I talked to, as I mentioned, these opportunity youth, disconnected youth, it was providing those kids with an opportunity. And then they go home, and they start to share that with their parents and they start to share that with their younger and brothers and sisters, and they also try to replicate and create a better and a different future, in some cases for the children that they may have started to have. So it is, it is complex, it brings all sectors together, but we have to start, and we have to engage, and we have to push back against what I, I think you were talking about, which are many of the negative kinds of messages that people are getting. Hi, um, I first of all want to thank you. My name is Julia, I'm a current political science major here at Rutgers. My question is, what inspires you the most about my generation, as Eagleton would say, the millennial generation, mm -hmm. and what can we do to affect policy change? Sure, well, what can you do? What have you already done? I mean, you look at the force the young people have been over the past couple of elections, growing in number in terms of political activity, um, but also growing um, in terms of national service and engagement, not only domestically, but also globally. And many of the young people that I've had the opportunity to work with, you know, I often think I would have never gotten into college if I had had to compete with you all. I mean, it's like, you know, the organizations that you, the nonprofits that you've started, the vision that you also have for social entrepreneurship, um, for the, biz, the private sector businesses that many young people have created. I was just talking to someone about a colleague's daughter who, and the colleges she just got into. It's like, well, she's trying to figure out where she wants to go. She might go to one school because she's already a co-holder of a patent with a professor at that college. I mean, there's this sense, what I'm inspired by is this sense of boundlessness. Um, the idea that you see a problem and take it on 
that you don't just see it and wish it were different and wish it would change, but the ability to use tools, and I think technology has a lot to do with this, to engage, to collaborate, to see and envision the future and take the steps to accomplish the goals that, that are in front of you. So I wouldn't say, what can you do? I would, I would commend you for the work that already has been done. And I would also say that that is what I find to be re so, so inspiring. I, I will close by saying my husband and I have just started or starting um, another smaller business in the sustainable agriculture field. And the first person that we've hired to work with us is a 23-year-old who just finished graduating from UVA, um, wants to stay in Nelson County, Virginia, but is you know, so entrepreneurial, so visionary, so committed to the, this work, and has done such a magnificent job helping us plan it and plan for this business. So it's not only inspiration, but it's also trust and looking for opportunities to collaborate with your, your generation to move forward and to address these big challenges that we have. Hi, Ms. Burns. Um, my name is Giovanna Morrison. I'm a graduating se senior here at Rutgers. Um, but my question basically is, because um, I'm from an urban community in East Orange. I'm sorry, could you just I, speak a little louder? I just couldn't oh, hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? That's better, thank oh, okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from an urban community in East Orange, and I mentor high school and middle school students. And I wanted to know basically how do we, um, I guess, promote or motivate the students to stay in school and be motivated about school when they're dealing with issues of once they leave the school grounds, they have to worry about if they're going to be the next victim of a shooting incident or if they're going to be, um, I guess, attacked by a gang in their neighborhood. So how do we deal with those type of issues and trying to keep them motivated on you know, an academic type of level when they're dealing with real life situations outside of the school grounds? Sure. Well, I think the first thing, and you say, how can we help keep them motivated, is that you can tell your story. You, you, first described yourself as a graduating senior. Did I hear you correctly? That's very powerful in and of itself. And I think when you tell your story, when you are open and you are vulnerable and you share with young people, here are the challenges, this is how I got here, this is why it was important to me, this is why it's important to set these goals, this is what I'm doing next, that they will relate to you better than they can relate to better than they can relate to me, better than they can relate to a lot of older adults who share their stories or, or dry statistics or something that they read in a book. So I think that first and foremost, that act of service on your part and the part of your peers is, is important and very, very powerful. Um, as a, as a po broader policy matter, it's part of the work that I'm doing at the Aspen Institute as we work with collaboratives Again, not private sector, philanthropic, faith-based, local elected and appointed officials across every sector, those communities that have created collaboratives that are specifically focused on working with young people to make sure that they either stay connected to education or that we can create these pathways for them so that they can reconnect, that they can finish school, that they can go on and get a post-secondary credential because that is so, 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 so critical. And one of the things that we're finding, I think it's consistent with what you're saying, is that these kinds of collaboratives are critical because in many instances they help create, they help strengthen or create a family and a level of support for young people that they may not already have. And as I talk to young people across the country, that is one of the key things that I, that I hear for them, from them. So as a policy matter, it's bringing to scale that kind of work. But I also think that you are a very, very powerful messenger in and of yourself. Don't be afraid of the power that you already have, because it exists. I hope you will share that with young people that you're talking about. A 
18 to 24 generation um, that you called the opportunity you. Um, but as I go about, uh, my brother started this nonprofit over 20 years ago. Unfortunately, he passed of um, cancer at a very young age. And um, as I go about trying to continue his legacy, one of the things he always wanted to do is serve that opportunity um, youth or group. And as I go about trying to look into ways of funding ish programs for adult education and uh, programs that would support that very specialized population that has all the problems that we mm -hmm. heard the young ladies and gentlemen so eloquently put um, of being involved in the juvenile justice system, um, life system, uh, grandparents raising them without the proper resources. I find that that is an uh, area where um, federal government and state government agencies have been pulling back aid. Mm -hmm. And so, so what will we do? Um, or where, where do you see policies or how can we affect policies that would make that um, come about to be a change? Because it's definitely economically a good investment mm -hmm. because if we can get more people into the workforce, we have more tax dollars coming in. So that's something that really needs to be looked at. But as I look around, the money for those types of things have been dried up. And right. those kids are kind of floating, they're homeless, they're hungry, they're not in the school, and the education that they're getting has been substandard or lacking of interest to them. Right. You're, you're exactly right. Um, a, couple of, a couple of things to say in response to your question. Uh, one, I'm just trying to order all the things uh, that I want to, to say in response. One, when I started, uh, when I was at the White House, we created a council. I, I led the Domestic Policy Council, and there we created the White House Council for Community Solutions, which was led by a woman named Patty Stonecipher. Stone she used to head the Gates Foundation, and a group of really incredible people across all sectors. In addition to focusing on how communities take on big challenges and solve them, and how they do that successfully, um, they identified this cross-sector strategy and a strategy that we call collective impact. It was the kind of things that I was mentioning at the end. How do you set a big goal, the fact that you have to measure it, how do you work collaboratively, on and on and on. They also very specifically looked at this issue of opportunity youth, and in fact that's why we coined this phrase opportunity youth, because we interviewed the young people that we're talking about. And as opposed to focusing and using a moniker that focused on the challenge, disconnected youth, what we heard from them was their dreams were huge. They didn't realize that they were disconnected from something. They felt like something had disconnected from them. Um, and what we wanted to capture was that sense of hopefulness and opportunity that they saw in themselves. The council made a series of recommendations to the president uh, last June. Um, for recommendations for things that the federal government could do, which include um, a series of pilot programs that are just starting um, to be implemented. I won't bore you with the regulatory process, but it's gone through a whole process of getting comments um, and being refined so that they can be proposed and go to work in various communities. And those pilots will start to come online, as well as a series of, of grants that are, folk, are opportunity youth grants um, that we've seen from some past work and kind of their, their ancestry, we know can be very successful. And how do we increase those grants? Also a focus in the administration across all the agencies that would bring people together with a very specific focus on this population so that it's better coordinated. So you don't have, you know, health and human services doing one thing and education doing another and Department of Justice doing another. How can we leverage this and focus on this in a laser-like way? So those recommendations are now in the process of being implemented, which is in one part of the, my answer to you, that the federal government, I think, is now bringing a more concerted, more laser-like focus on this challenge. It is also what led to the work that I'm doing at the Aspen Institute, um, where we have been raising funds and have developed an Opportunity Youth Incentive Fund for millions of dollars that we're going to be putting into communities and collaboratives around the country um, doing this, this same work. Um, so I would say that there is a new focus on this. I would also say, you know, based on some conversations I had just this afternoon, 
um, to stay tuned. I think there you will see an increased emphasis on, on this work for the very reasons you mentioned. People recognize it as a challenge, but it's a challenge that we can, that we can take on. Um, and that there are smart solutions, there are smart programs out there, but we've been, too often been program rich and system poor. We have to think about ways to work collaboratively and take the, take the smart work to scale. Yeah, if you go, the Department of Education has been leading this work. Um, and I think if you look for the Opportunity Youth Pilot programs there, but also, if you um, go to the Aspen Institute website um, for the Aspen Forum for Community Solutions, there's more information there. Um, and soon there will, and it'll come through that Aspen website. There'll be some additional tools and, uh, and a digital forum for people around the country to, and communities to engage. Good evening, Ms. Barnes. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm so used to sitting on my, uh, in my, on my bed and watching you <laughs> on the morning, during the mornings. It's good to see you face to face. Thank you. Uh, my question to you is, uh, I have a 20-year-old uh, daughter mm -hmm. who is now a sophomore at the University of Maryland. And I'm curious about your pathway to arrive where you are right now in government. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I ask that is that I also have a junior in high school, that young people are under so much pressure going into college at the undergraduate level to decide on a major <laughs> and to know what they want to do for the rest of their lives. And mm -hmm. I think that is such tremendous pressure to put on young people. And so as I read your, your biography, I see that you started out as a history major. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about what was your inspiration that led you into uh, the federal government? I see that you have a law degree. So where did, where, what was your pathway? And what was your inspiration and your catalyst to get you to where you are right now? Sure. Uh, let's see. I, one of the things, and often when I will talk to young people and they'll say, ask me about my career path. And I will say to them, jokingly, kind of, um, I was not the person that had a 10-year plan or a 20-year plan. You know, I'm going to be the domestic policy advisor in, you know, 2009. What I ultimately have used is a guiding set of principles. And I, as opportunities, became available or I was looking at various opportunities, I always asked myself, what door would this opportunity open? What door would it close? And how would it allow me to continue work that I find fulfilling and that I believe to be important? So it wasn't the search for a, and I'm not saying you're asking this, but it, it was never a search for a particular title. It was the pursuit of a cause and, fulfill, and fulfilling work. And so if you, if you back up, you know, I chose my history major because I love history. I had the most amazing history teachers in high school. And people that I have, you know, sent notes to over the past few years and thanked because they were so inspirational to me. Um, and I thought a lot when I was in college about what I wanted to do, and I was in a program in college, the North Carolina Fellows Program, and they'd select about 20 fellows every year. We had this amazing woman, Marjorie Christensen, I still remember her name, and it's been a long time since I was 20, and she really challenged us to think about why we wanted to do what, we, why do you want to go to law school? Why do you want this major? And that constant pushing and thinking and challenging was very, very important. And then, as I said, I'd use that set that it kind of, for me, it was a gatekeeper. Would it allow me to do fulfilling and interesting work? Would it allow me to continue to move toward what I believe to be my purpose or not? And that became the series of judgments that I would use. And I would say, as I became older, I also started to think, what else, what do I want my whole life to look like? And I, to, to the heart of your question, I do believe there, you know, there's so much pressure because of the job market that we're in right now, because of the cost of education, for young people to make a decision right now, right now, right now. 
But one of the things I often tell young people is that you need to learn something about yourself. That first set of lessons has to be, who am I? What are my gifts? What are my talents? What is it that I want to wake up and do every day? Where is it that I can be of service? What is it that I love to do? And when I, for me, it is where that talent intersects with purpose and service, that's the sweet spot. And that's where you want to live. And that's the way that you want to build your career because your career is in, in, in essence building your life. And at the end of the day, I want to be able to look back and say, I have done good work. I have done something that I believe is worthwhile and has purpose. And for me, that means, can, have I helped people? Have I been able to help change communities? Have I done something that I can be proud of? And that's, that is really, the, those are the filters that I've used to shape the, the work that I do. Hi. Um, you may have answered this question because you, um, you did give some resources to the lady earlier um, about some websites. But my question has to do with the collaborative efforts that you were referring to um, and how we might take advantage of the opportunity with the social entrepreneurship and these collaborative efforts without sort of diluting the public service element um, to the work that needs to get done. Um, well, you know, introducing a possibility of profit may dilute that, and how can we sort of encode those principles into the work? And is there a clearinghouse or something for um, some, the best practices that are being learned about and w where other people can sort of utilize that set of, of tools that are being developed? So you mean best practices around um, um, well, collective? Well, um, well, I imagine that the collaborative efforts you're talking about between pri public and private um, are uh, have a lot of um, coordinating, planning, pr management, sure. project management. Mm -hmm. There's best best practices from business, combining that with the with the service element from the public sector. I'm sure that there's a lot that's being built there that um, doesn't. Everybody doesn't have to build on their own. They can build on what yes what's being developed. Yeah, ab absolutely. In fact, one of the things, and this is under development, but in the next few months will be up and running, um, we've coordinated, we, the Asthma Institute, a partnership with the organization called um, FSG. And we are building a digital forum to do exactly that, to share best practices, um, to create a learning community for people so communities can um, engage with each other in real time. It's like, I'm having a problem with that. How, do, how did you fix it? Or this worked really well. Share that information. So we're building that. Um, so I would say if you look at the Aspen website in a few months, there will be access to that information. And then on the service component, um, there's a project called the Franklin Project um, and na that's focused on national service. How do we build a big movement around national service? And Later this year, at the end of June, we'll be having a big, there will be a big announcement around um, some specific strategies on that. And we have been working very, very closely with the Franklin Project um, to make sure that there's an opportunity youth component to the national service work that, that's going to be underway uh, and recommended there. And that's an, ish, uh, an effort that you know, General McChrystal and Mad Secretary Madeleine Albright and others, I mean, a number of national and international leaders have been helping us to, to build and to coordinate. I want you to all join me in thanking you. Oh, sure. Thank you. I really, I really cannot think of a better way to honor the memory of Senator Lippman than to participate in a conversation like the one we've had tonight about the most pressing policy issues that affect the communities that Senator Lippman cared so much about. And I thought that when you talked about that sweet spot 
um, that you find where your passion and a commitment to service and doing good in the world meet, um, that that is exactly what you have done and that is exactly what Senator Lippman did. And I want to thank, thank you, you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.